On September 29th of 2015, the police received a call from a frantic man. He said that his wife was dead and that he needed help. This is the case of Thomas Clayton. Hello, friend, and welcome to High Time Crime. My name's Joel, and on here I specialize in true crime and also climbing trees. Ah. I love nature, but today we're going over the case of Thomas Clayton and what he did to his wife. You're going to learn about how terrible of a person he is and what it's like to do something heinous. For our story, we're heading to Elmira, New York. Elmira is a city in the county seat of Shemung County. With a population of around 27,000 people, it's an interesting place. Originally named the Township of Shemung, it was changed to the town of Elmira in 1808. This was done at a town meeting held at a place called Teal's Tavern. The town is named after either the owner of the tavern, Nathan Teal's daughter, or it's named after our major general, Matthew Carpenter's daughter. It's not really known, but it's most likely one of these two. The city is nicknamed the Queen City, and it originally served as a transportation hub for New York's southern tier in the 1800s. It connected commercial centers located in Rochester and Buffalo with Albany and New York City through the canal system and railroads. In the 1860s, during the Civil War, there was also a prisoner of war camp here. It was dubbed as Helmyra by its inmates, which I thought was pretty neat. Nowadays, if you ever decide to visit, there's a whole lot of tourist traps and places to go. You could take your family, or just yourself, to the Eldridge Park, which is full of fun things. You can ride rides, go fishing, paddle boating, mini golfing, go skateboarding, or even just take a walk. You could take a trip on down to the National Soaring Museum and learn all about aviation. That's pretty fly, right? What? I thought that was pretty good. You could even visit Mark Twain's summer house or his grave. He was an American writer, most known for his books, The Adventures of Tom Sawyer, Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, and so on. Very interesting guy, but Mr. Twain is not why we're in town today. Kelly Elizabeth Stage Clayton was born on August 1st of 1980 in Elmira, New York to Howard and Elizabeth Stage. Her father was the fire chief for the West Elmira Volunteer Fire Department for a long time, and they were known throughout the town. Kelly was the youngest of three children. She had a sister named Kim and a brother named Leonard. Growing up, she went to Elmira Free Academy where she would participate on the cheerleading squad and softball team. She was also an honor roll student and friends at school remember her as a person everyone knew and everyone liked. She brought an incredibly positive energy and light to anyone she came across and she was a welcoming, energetic, and happy person and she was always smiling. Her laugh was very infectious. She graduated from high school in 1998 and then went to the State University of New York in Oneonta with goals of being a teacher. She also had aspirations of being a model as well. Kelly's sister Kim looked after her as she was 10 years older and also described her as being vivacious, bold, and sassy. Kelly would eventually graduate and pursue her goals of becoming a teacher, but she became a bit bored. Don't get me wrong, she loved teaching and everything that came with it, but she just felt like she wanted something else. Her personality was bubbly, and she was open to new adventures, and this is where Sin City comes in, the city of Las Vegas. Kelly decided to pack up everything and moved to Nevada in her early 20s. She became a cocktail waitress at a place called the Imperial Palace, which was a hotel and casino. Before she moved, she told her family about wanting to go, and this made them all sad, but they understood. Kelly enjoyed her time in Vegas, but after a bit, she just felt like that life also wasn't for her. So for the second time, she packed her bags, but this time moved back home to the city of Elmira. In 2005, she decided to go watch the Elmira Jackals play ice hockey with her best friend, Andrea Spyrock. They were a minor league team that played from 2000 to 2007. While the girls were watching the teams play, Kelly saw someone on the ice that would immediately catch her eye. This guy was wearing a number 18 jersey and he was playing the forward position. This guy's name is Tom Clayton. Thomas Scott Clayton to be exact and 
He was born on March 17th of 1978 in Binghamton, New York to Scott and Phyllis Clayton. His father worked as a landscaper and his mother managed a fast food company. He grew up very well liked, an okay student, but a good athlete. Most of his time was spent playing hockey and he was exceptional at it. Tom graduated high school and then went to Niagara University to continue playing hockey. This was a small Catholic school located in Buffalo, New York. He played the forward position and he was very good at it. So good to the point that he got recruited to a minor league team the same season he graduated. This was 2002 and that team was the Elmira Jackals. They were a new Eastern Conference team and only joined the United Hockey League two years prior in 2000. Tom said that he wanted to pursue a career in hockey and that he wanted to play somewhere. He thought Elmira would be a great fit because he had family in Binghamton and they could see him play. He had a reputation of being a bit of a bad boy on the ice. Tom wasn't the biggest in stature, but he played like he was two times his size. He liked to start fights. He was scrappy, tough, and dead set on winning. He would do whatever it took to win at any costs. Tom was considered a hothead and it got to the point where his aggression spilled over into his personal life. In 2003, he would end up getting in a fight outside of the ice and getting in a bit of trouble for it. While he was out with a teammate named Brad Wingnut Wingfield, they got into a brawl with four police cadets in an Elmira bar. The fight started because Tom was reportedly dancing nude on the tabletops, and so the cadets said something to him. That night, Tom got charged with a misdemeanor and Brad a felony but they were later reduced to disorderly conducts. Tom got very lucky, and this actually ended up boosting his reputation, especially with women. He had a lot of female fans who wanted everything to do with him, and so this is where Kelly comes back into play. When she went to the game and saw Tom in 2005, she had her eyes locked on him. After the game, the girls ended up going to a bar where they just so happened to see Tom. Strange way how fate works, isn't it? Kelly's best friend, Andrea, decided to walk up to Tom and say, are you dating anyone? And so he said, who's asking? And so she replied, well, not me. And she pointed over to her friend sitting at the bar. Kelly was sitting at the bar. And so Tom looks at her and then looks back at Andrea and says, who, the blonde? She's incredible. Kelly and Tom immediately hit it off, like right away. It was almost a fairy tale type of relationship, and they decided to move very quickly. Less than a year later, and in 2006, they got married. Kelly was so happy to marry Tom, and she was basically the perfect hockey wife. She went to all of his games and absolutely adored him. During one of Tom's games, he ended up having a career-ending injury. He also had been rejected by the National Hockey League way too many times and decided to retire. He said that it was just a different phase in his life. Tom told the Elmira Star Gazette in an interview in 2014 that the minors is not all glory like the NHL. You're riding on buses many hours and many days, and at that point in my life, I had to make a decision. Did I want to bounce around the minors or start a family and do other things? He decided to move with his new wife to Charlotte, North Carolina. In 2007, their first child was born, a baby daughter named Charlie. Tom felt like he needed more, and so he went into business for himself. He bought several multi-unit properties and started a taxi business for people too drunk to drive home. He started to make good money and little by little acquired more and more properties. Kelly was waiting tables during this period of time, but it wasn't long before they had their second baby in 2012, a boy named Colin. Tom and Kelly decided to take their little family back to New York and move into a brown paneled house on a wooden street in Caton. Caton is a small little town with a population of around 2,000 people. A very remote area where everybody knows everybody, and on their street, there weren't many other houses. Kelly continued waiting tables while Tom got into house remediation. He opened a franchise of a place called Paul Davis, which specializes in that realm. He also teamed up with another retired Jackals player, James Sheehan, to buy and manage multi-unit properties. Tom later became a project manager at a company called ServPro. Business was good and Tom liked to show off his wealth. He was addicted to playing high stakes poker games and considered to be unfaithful or a wanderer. 
On the outside, he portrayed an image of someone who was a family man, but that's not who he really was. He started having affairs with other women, and he would tell them things about Kelly. He would say things like, she's a bitch, or she's lazy, and that he wants a divorce. But he would then say that a divorce is out of the question because she would clean him of all of his money, and that's all he cared about. Tom was not satisfied with Kelly, but she had no idea. She thought their marriage was fine and that nothing was wrong. She had no idea that Tom was out cheating on her with multiple other women. So because he thought divorce wasn't an option, it's possible he believed that the only way out was with Kelly gone. In 2014, Tom doubled the life insurance policy of Kelly from a half a million dollars to a million dollars. I say this every time I hear this exact occurrence, but if someone does this to you and you just so happen to figure out about it, run! But it's very clear that around this time, Tom started to think evil thoughts and began to formulate a plan. About a year later, on September 28th of 2015, something terrible happened. Tom had played a lot of poker with his friends, and this night was no different. It was a Monday, and he was at Greg and Lucky Miller's house, and this was a regular thing that he did. They lived very close in a nearby town called Corning. At about midnight, the poker game came to an end, and so Tom got in his truck and drove about 15 minutes back to his home in Caton. He walked in the door, and on the kitchen floor, Kelly was lying dead in a pool of blood. Shocked, he immediately called 911, and here's that. Help me, help me, my wife. She's dead. Hurry. Okay, just stay on the line with me. How long has she been down? I don't know. I don't know. I just got home. The police would arrive shortly after to find a gruesome scene that they would remember for the rest of their lives. The fight appeared to have began upstairs and Kelly tried to get away, but sadly wasn't able to. It was obvious that she fought really hard for not only her life, but her children's lives as well. They were in the house at this time, and she knew that she had to do anything she could to ensure that they would stay safe. The officer who first arrived on scene noticed that there were a lot of things that just didn't seem right. Tom had said that their daughter Charlie had told Tom that there had been a robbery at their house, but there were no signs of forced entry and nothing appeared to have been stolen or compromised. Nothing suggested a burglary, and Tom also said to the officer, well, you know it wasn't me because my truck has GPS on it. Ah, yes. Definitely something that someone who's innocent would say. Kelly's older sister Kim arrived on the scene shortly after being notified, and it's honestly heartbreaking to hear. <laughs> the police grew suspicious of Tom right away, and so he was taken down to the station and questioned. Kelly's family members were also questioned, and one of them told the police they should look into a man named Michael Beard. Michael had worked for the same company Tom did, and also did work for him around his house. He would do things like mowing the grass, digging things, cutting things down, and whatever needed to be done, he would do it. Michael got fired from ServPro when the owner found out that he was stealing things from homes that they were working at, and he was also a tenant of one of Tom's properties and was facing eviction because he couldn't pay the rent. It appeared as if he had grudges against Tom, and so the police looked at him as an obvious suspect. They had no idea what they were in for or what they were about to discover. Michael was brought in for questioning and denied any involvement. He agreed to take a polygraph test and this revealed a lot. While polygraph tests don't exactly determine someone's innocence, they're definitely pretty accurate. Michael passed his test. No, I'm just kidding. He failed it miserably. The investigators began to look deeper into him and found out he had a girlfriend named Holly Barrett. She told them everything she knew happened and so the police cornered Michael and he spilled the beans. He told them exactly what occurred and he brought them to all of the evidence. This includes a set of house keys given to Michael by Tom Clayton. He said that he was given the keys by Tom because he was doing a job. That job was a hit. Tom had went to Michael and told him that he would pay him $10,000 if he killed Kelly. Tom knew that he was down bad and really needed money. The plan was for Michael to go inside, kill Kelly, and then set the house and the cars on fire. All while the kids were inside, but Tom didn't care. He wanted him to set the house on fire with the kids in it. 
This was all a part of a huge insurance scam that Tom was attempting to mastermind. Hence the reason he doubled Kelly's life insurance policy. But a problem here was that Tom had a very solid alibi. GPS tracking put him at his friend's house and all of his friends also said he was there. Kelly's children were questioned, specifically Charlie, because she was seven years old at the time, and she revealed some crazy information. She said that there was a robber in the house and that a man was hurting mommy. She had to be interviewed by specially trained interrogators, and here's that. What did you hear? Like, my mom ran to the door screaming, Charlie, 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 Charlie. Can you tell me what he looked like? Like, he was wearing jeans, a black long sleeve shirt, and a mask. Okay. What did the robber look like? He looked like my dad. And, and why do you say that? How did he look like your dad? The mask and his shoes. How about the size of him? Was he a big, big guy or was he a little guy? The size of my dad. Did the robber say anything? Mm-hmm. 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 But she said that the mask she saw the robber in looks a lot like the one that her daddy uses when he goes hunting. Tom is a narcissist and will use anyone at his disposal to do things for him. He took advantage of people in every single avenue that he could. While he was at the poker game, a woman named Lucky Miller told police that Tom had asked to use her phone around 90 minutes before Kelly's body was found. When she got her phone back, she noticed that there was no call, and so Tom deleted the call but the police later found it through phone records and it was revealed that Michael was on the receiving end. These two were in constant contact, either calling or texting, leading up to the days of Kelly's murder. The specific call that Tom deleted between them, however, was the official call to put the plan into action. Michael Beard, along with a friend named Marcus Blanford, who served as a lookout for Michael, went to the house in Caton using Tom's truck. Michael went inside and did what he came to do, except he didn't burn the house down or set the cars on fire. It's terrible he went through with what he did, but thankfully he at least didn't go through with killing the children. Michael said that Tom had asked him to take out Kelly, and if the kids were there, not to leave any witnesses. I just want to say words do not do justice to what I want to say about him. When a trial came, Michael decided to change his story around for some reason. He now started to say that he was innocent and that he had nothing to do with Kelly's murder. He said that the plan was for him to burn the house down and he was going to receive money for insurance from Tom. He said that he went inside and found Kelly already dead. Michael decided to blame Tom for everything and said that he's the killer not him. Despite the fact that Michael led detectives to not only physical evidence that proves he's guilty, but to the murder weapon, in November of 2016, he was convicted of first and second degree murder and sentenced to life without parole plus 25 years. When Tom was arrested, he immediately got out on bond and began to do what he does best be a terrible person. Because there was no evidence directly linking him to the crime, he pleaded not guilty. The investigators looked deeper and deeper into him and found out he was having multiple affairs. One woman was a State Farm insurance agent who said that Tom complained about Kelly all the time. One was a friend of Kelly's and another one was even a 15 year old girl. Like dude, you're 40. On January 9th of 2017, Tom was finally brought to trial for the murder of his wife. The case was built on nothing but circumstantial evidence, but because of the technology we have, it showed that he was not innocent. His defense attorneys tried to claim that because another man was guilty, Tom was innocent. But due to details coming out left and right, it wouldn't take long before a bit of justice would be served. The jury came back with a verdict in only six hours in February of 2017, and Tom was found guilty of first-degree murder and second-degree murder, and he was sentenced to life without parole. During the trial, Charlie, the daughter of Kelly, said, Dear Judge, I feel that my dad is a coward because he asked Michael Beard to kill my mom. Facts. Absolute facts, Charlie. Also, Tom tried to say that a woman he spent with a summer prior wasn't a girlfriend of his, but in fact a seer who allowed him to experience visions of his slain wife. What a loony tune. The lookout for Michael, Mark Blanford, was sentenced to three to six years in prison, which I feel isn't enough. 
Kelly Elizabeth's stage was a bright light in a dark world. She lit up rooms, but at the same time was sassy, so if you had a problem with her, no you didn't. But even till the very end, she fought as hard as she could for her children, and that really says something about her character. One of her last words was, run, yelling to Charlie. It's terrible to know what she went through that night, absolutely terrible. Every year in Elmira, they paint the town purple in memory of Kelly, and I think that's a great thing. If you're curious about where her children ended up, they're now in the care of her older sister Kim, and they appear to be doing great. I hope that Kelly is resting peacefully, and that her children, especially Charlie, are able to recover and eventually live normal lives. As for Tom Clayton, what an awful person. He failed at becoming a professional hockey player, and he failed at being a husband. He failed at many things, and in the end, those failures caught up to him. I hope that jail treats him terribly. But anyways, thank you for watching this episode of High Time Crime. If true crime is your thing, then please subscribe and hit the like button because that's all we do. I also have a second account with my brother named Horrifying where we tell stories about everything paranormal. This includes true crime, mysteries, and things that are just downright spooky. I'd greatly appreciate if you subscribe to that too. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Take care, friend.